Hello everyone and welcome to our Advanced Methods webinar series. My name is Anne Greenwood. I'm the Education and Training Unit for Population Data BC and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Law. He will be presenting on Regression Discontinuity Design. By way of introduction, Michael is a Canadian Research Chair in Access to Medicines at the Centre of Health Services and Policy Research at the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia. So thanks again, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Michael, for presenting, and I'll pass it over to you. Uh, thanks, Anne, and thanks for everyone for uh, for joining. As Anne said, please feel free to um, put questions into the chat as we go along, and we'll try to make things. Uh, I'll try to make uh, any clarifications or questions that you have as you go. Um, I jokingly told Anne that she was allowed to introduce me in one sentence, so I'm uh, very glad that uh, that she stuck to her end of the deal. Um, you all, and you can see my slides, I assume, at this point. Okay, so today I'm gonna talk to you all about regression discontinuity designs. And I have uh, some content here that'll sort of go over the design and give you some idea of how it works. I'm gonna show an example uh, based on BC's Fair Pharmacare program. So this is an example from my own work that we use Pop Data BC data to complete. So there's, there's your mandatory Pop Data plug for today. And then I'm going to talk a bit about how to model an RD. And I'm going to do one of, and I'm going to do two things here. Either I'm going to refer you to an online course that I have that you can take on edX for free if you actually want to learn to model it. Or I've also put some slides at the end here. So if we have some extra time and folks are really keen, we can, uh, we can get into that uh, part of things. So that's the, the overview. And I'm just going to launch right in. Um, and please tell me also, you know, this is an advanced web, this is sold as an advanced methods webinar. I wasn't 100% sure about what level folks are coming at. So if things are too basic or you want me to speed up, just tell me and, uh, and I will do that. So a regression discontinuity design for those of you who um, haven't used one or haven't been exposed to one before, is in a design where you compare trends in an outcome above or below a threshold in a forcing variable. And so a forcing variable is a really important concept um, in a regression discontinuity. And basically it's a variable where there's some change in whether or not people get a certain treatment or a certain intervention or, or whatnot. Um, so the example that I'm going to present later in the BC Fair Pharmacare program um, folks above and below $15,000 and $30,000 of household income get different treatment by the plan. So folks with lower incomes get better coverage, and then it switches right at that $15,000 uh, mark. You see these kind of thresholds all over medicine and all over health policy. Um, so, you know, just recently the government announced that they were going to introduce a dental plan uh, that's going to work across Canada, and they budgeted for it. And they've said that this plan will cover households above and below $70,000. So that's going to be one of these discontinuities, again, at $70,000 of household income. It can also be a measurement. You know, in clinical medicine, a lot of times, there are these thresholds above and below which folks will get treatment. So one that we've used in the past is in lower middle income countries, and I do a lot of work in Rwanda, it used to be the fact that you would, if you had a CD4 count of 500, um, or below, you would get treatment. And if you were above 500, um, you would not get treatment. And so that's, again, one of these thresholds where it, the threshold itself dictates the treatment. So the, the part of the threshold that a regression discontinuity uh, basically exploits is the fact that folks on one side of that threshold are gonna be really similar to folks on another. Like, let's think about that CD4 example. So you've got a CD4 of 500, and you've got this threshold, folks on this side who are higher are gonna be uh, not treated, and folks on this side are gonna be treated. Now, if you think about someone whose CD4 count is 499, and someone whose CD4 count is 501, it's probably safe to assume that those individuals are reasonably similar. So, you know, this person and this person are gonna be reasonably similar in most characteristics, in terms of their clinical outcomes, in terms of all sorts of things. But that threshold means that this individual will receive the treatment and this individual won't. So the threshold acts as a kind of quasi-randomization in a way, um, and you can use that quasi-randomization to explore what the effect of the intervention is at a CD4 count of 500. 
So the counterfactual, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the idea of a counterfactual, this is the idea of what would have happened absent of intervention. So the alternate world, the problem with the counterfactual is that you could never observe it, of course. The counterfactual is that the existing trend in the outcome above and below the threshold would have been smooth absent that treatment. So let's go back again to that CD4 example. That's a CD4 count of 500. It goes up from there to say 600. Here's 400. And let's say your outcome is survival. Now, survival is going to improve as you go up in CD4 count, because that means your disease has progressed less. So you might expect to see some curve in, in your survival outcome. Now, what a regression discontinuity is going to assume is that that line would have been smooth across that threshold had treatment not been there. But we know that these folks get treatment and these folks don't. So you might, ex you might actually observe a drop in survival relative to that counterfactual afterward. And that's where your estimate is going to come from in a regression discontinuity. I'm going to go through some examples that will hopefully make this even clearer. But this is the basic idea. You're leveraging the quasi-randomization of that threshold to come up with an estimate. And so just in general terms, you have this idea of the forcing variable here. You have folks below a threshold and above a threshold, and you have some trend. Now, this trend can go up, it can go down. It doesn't particularly matter. It can go in, um, in whatever direction. But what you're going to uh, assume, of course, as I just pointed out, is that that counterfactual is smooth across. So it would have continued on that same trajectory that you observed in, on this side where you're below the threshold. You're then potentially, you're then going to observe whether there's a change or not uh, after, that, uh, after that threshold. And then your regression discontinuity estimate comes from this change at the threshold the sort of immediate shift in the level of that outcome on one side of the of the threshold versus the other side of the threshold. Is that concept clear? If anyone's having trouble with uh, with with what I'm saying or I'm going uh, too quick, just throw a message into the uh, uh, into the chat and then I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to clarify. Okay. Hearing nothing. I'm going to point out sort of specifically what a regression discontinuity actually estimates. So because you're working on a threshold, you're working on this idea of folks on one side of the threshold versus another, the estimate that you get out of a regression discontinuity analysis is what's called a local average treatment effect or abbreviated uh, as the LAT or the late. And what the interpretation is, is it's the effect of the receipt of the intervention for those who would not have received it absent the change in the eligibility at the threshold. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna again step back to that C4 example. And if you have treatment shifting at a CD4 count of 500, what the local average treatment effect will tell you, say we observed something like we had previously when I was, um, when I was presenting before, you know, if this was a difference in survival of say 2%, or something like that, that would tell you that the local average treatment effect is a survival benefit of 2% for individuals at a CD4 count of 500. And this is sort of the, this is one of the things about a regression discontinuity that actually is a bit limiting, because really you can only say something about the effect of the intervention at that threshold, so at the point at which the quasi-randomization comes into play. So it doesn't really tell you what the survival benefit for someone at 300 would be, or for someone at 700. Those aren't what you're going to be able to estimate with, uh, with this type of method. What you're gonna be able to estimate is something around five, is something about 500. Now that doesn't stop you from taking that estimate and extrapolating it and saying, look, if it works at 500, it probably works at six and it probably works at seven, um, but the method itself can't tell you anything specific about that. Um, Anne is also reminding you in the chat that you can use the raise ha hand icon if you want to uh, uh, ask me a question directly. And I'd be happy to take those as we go. And then quickly, I'm going to also cover the biases that one can run into here. So the, the way that you run into problems here with internal validity 
are if the um, or the things that can make you come up with an answer that's not correct are three major things. So one would be a co-intervention or something that's not smooth that makes the curve not smooth across the um, across the the threshold. The assumption in a regression discontinuity is that that trend that you estimate on one side of the threshold would continue on the other side um, absent that intervention. So in the case of the CD4 example, it would be the trend would continue smoothly across 500 if nobody got treatment below 500, so that non-smooth curve. Where you can run into trouble is if something else changes at that same point. So in the case of the CD4 count example, say you got treatment if you were under 500, but you also got better follow-up from doctors and more frequent appointments and re or, or referral to a better clinic or something along those lines, something else that would also influence your outcomes. That would be a co-intervention and that would be p potentially problematic because then when you estimate that treatment effect, it's not just the medication it's also that additional follow-up or that additional um, uh, that additional attention from the health sector. The other thing that can matter is instrumentation. So the, the measure, method of measurement differs above and below the threshold. So thinking about that um, CD4 example, if the individuals getting treatment are followed more frequently and we watch for their outcomes more closely, um, or they're measured in different clinics than the folks that aren't getting treatment or something along those lines. So something where the measurement on one side of the threshold differs from measurement on the other. Um, that can be that could be a potential issue because then you could see a shift in the outcome, but it's because of the way that things are being measured, not because of the way in which the actual outcomes are being experienced. And the final one would be ascertainment. So if individuals are differentially included in the sample on either side of the threshold, so again, stepping back to that CD4 example, you can imagine that if folks are getting treatment, they're more likely to show up at clinic, more likely to be followed, and then we'll be able to follow their outcomes. Um, whereas the folks that aren't getting treatment might not get follow up as, um, uh, followed up as closely as, as others. And so if we have a lot more missing data on one side or a lot more dropout from the um, from our ability to to measure the outcomes in those groups, uh, then that could be a potential issue as well. So these are three things that you need to be aware of. The one thing I, I do uh, want to present as another example, just to make um, uh, to make this obvious. So if you had a, a co-intervention, you know, often folks will talk about retirement as a thing to um, uh, as a potential intervention for various things and I've seen regression discontinuity studies that have looked at the effect of re retirement on mortality and all those sorts of things the trouble with retirement is that there's all sorts of stuff that happens at 65 like folks retire but they also become eligible for a lot of um, uh, a lot of federal benefits they've become eligible for things like drug coverage in Ontario you know there's all sorts of things that uh, that change at that point in time so you do need to be particularly aware when you use a threshold about what it is exactly that's changing um, at those uh, at those points. Okay. So with that introduction, I actually find it easiest to teach regression discontinuities with an example. So we're gonna spin right into um, one of my, um, uh, a couple of papers that are similar that we wrote using data from Fair Pharmacare. But I will pause for a second. I'm going to take a drink. And if anybody has any questions on what I've done so far, please feel free to uh, to put them forward. Here's your opportunity. <laughs> you don't need to wait. I've, I've tried to encourage them not to be shy, but no. It's we'll fine. People can be as shy as they like. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll move on and hopefully we'll circle back at the end and if folks have questions, we can, uh, we can work through them. We'll probably have some time. So the example I'm gonna share with you is two papers that we wrote on the BC Fair Pharmacare, Fair Pharmacare program. So as I'm sure a lot of you will know, Canada um, has universal uh, coverage for physician and hospital services in uh, every province. Drug coverage, um, in contrast, is highly variable, and we have a lot of different drug plan designs in different provinces. In British Columbia, um, 
British Columbia is one of several Canadian drug um, public drug plans that has an income-based deductible uh, program. So what that means is that in British Columbia, for most people who are on the sort of universal drug plan, you have to spend three or four percent of your household income on prescription drugs that are covered by the plan before the plan will actually kick in and cover anything. So if your income as a household, say, was $50,000, you would have to spend $2,000 out of pocket on prescription drugs before you were covered. And beyond that point, then coverage kicks in. It's actually a little more nuanced than that, but that's the general idea. So the question we have, since a lot of provinces use these, is what's the impact of these deductibles on drug use and the use of other healthcare services? And so the questions are different. You know, there's good evidence out there that uh, charging people for prescription drugs causes them not to use them. And there's uh, estimates that at least a couple of million people in Canada can't afford the prescriptions that they're given by a physician. So we're, we're interested in the role that these deductibles might be playing in that. And then there's also this idea of trade-offs. So if you don't take, say, your uh, drug for blood pressure, you maybe you end up in the hospital more frequently. And so really from a policy standpoint, this is sort of squeezing the balloon at one end and it blows up at the other. So both of those were important aspects to this, uh, to this question for us. So then with the methods, um, the first thing we did is we used data from everyone in the province. So anyone who is eligible for, the, um, for BC's Fair Pharma Care Program uh, was entered into our, uh, into our sample. We focused on two different groups in the two different studies. So in the first, we looked at folks who were um, born or in the years around 1939. I'll explain why that's important in a second. And then the other, we focused on folks in, uh, in the lower income groups. Um, but we took everyone in the province who was around those two thresholds, as you'll see in a bit. Um, we use data in, from, sorry, that animation is uh, not working quite right. Let me just open that up again. Okay, we use data from um, 2003, when Fair Pharmacare was first put into place, all the way up to uh, 2015. And then we use data from the PharmaNet system. And so for those who aren't familiar with, um, with PharmaNet, it's a system that the um, BC government uses um, and it essentially tracks every prescription drug that's dispensed in the province. Um, so if you go and get a prescription from a pharmacy in the province of British Columbia, it goes into PharmaNet and we can look at the information on the cost, the characteristics of that drug and whatnot. So we use those, uh, those three. We also linked those PharmaNet claims with data from uh, the medical services plan uh, to get the number of physician visits and the cost of those physician visits for, for these individuals, as well as to the discharge abstract database, which allowed us to look at um, hospital utilization and expenditures over, um, over, that, uh, over that time. Oh, Michael, uh, Rachel's just asking uh, the previous slide, if you could repeat the question on the previous slide. On this slide here? I think so. Is that correct, Rachel? I think it was just the introduction, what, what was the question that you were asking? Yes, she said. Yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah. The question is, what, what do these deductibles do? So do these deductibles cause people to use uh, less prescription drugs? Um, and does it, um, does it lead to folks uh, using more health services because they have these charges for prescription drugs? Uh, does them not using prescription drugs because of those charges lead to them using the physician or the hospital more than they might otherwise? So I'll run through that again. And so here's the design of Fair Pharmacare. And I won't get into too much detail on the parts of this that don't matter, but there's a couple of thresholds in here that we utilize and this is, and that's why. So let's start here on the left. So this is everyone who's born before 1939. Um, so for political reasons, when Fair Pharmacare was introduced in 2003, Folks over 65 had better drug coverage previously. So the government designed Fair Pharmacare to have better drug coverage for that population. And so they made different coverage or what's called enhanced coverage available for um, individuals that were over 65 at the time. And you'll see here as you go up in income, which is down on the slide, um, you get sort of more charges as you go up. So this group here has a 
no deductible. So there's no amount of, to pay out of pocket. And then they pay 25% of the cost of their drugs. So if the drug's 100 bucks, they pay 25, up to a maximum of 1.25% of their household income. The group from 14 to 30 also has a zero income, or a 0% deductible and a similar co-payment. And then this group um, above $30,000 has a 1% of household income deductible. So if you have an income of $50,000, you'd have to pay 500 out of pocket before the provincial plan kicks in. On the other side of the ledger, you can see that we start out with a deductible at $0 for the group from zero to $15,000 of household income. It then immediately goes to 2% as soon as you cross this threshold from 15. And then when you cross it from 30, it becomes 3%. Um, and then there's, there's co-payments and maximums as well. I'm not gonna focus on those as much, but the changes in the deductibles are really what we're interested in because that's where you have to pay the whole amount out of your own pocket um, before the coverage kicks in at all. So I'm gonna go into the first paper to start. So the first paper here, and this was published in CMAJ if you're interested in, the, uh, uh, in looking it up, and I'll give you the reference at the end of the talk. Um, but here we leveraged one of the thresholds in age. So the difference between the coverage for individuals born in 1939 and earlier and the folks born in 1940 and later. So if we remember back and have simplified this chart a little bit by just putting in the deductible amounts, if you focus in here, you'll see that if you're born in 1939 or earlier and you have a household income bet between 14 and 30, you have no deductible. As soon as you cross that threshold to 1940, you instantly get a 2% of household income deductible. So to put that in, uh, in terms, let's say a household of, uh, with a household income of $20,000, this group would pay a $0 deductible. Um, and uh, this group would pay 2% um, of 40 off the top of my head. I think it's 400. Uh, before uh, before the provincial drug coverage would kick in, so it's a big difference, especially at that level of uh, that level of household uh, income. So this was the first the first threshold we leveraged, and then so I'm going to hop straight into yeah. Just a clarification from Rachel. So, and I think you've answered this, but just so everybody's clear. So the intervention is the deductible, and the threshold is 1940. Is that correct? Correct. Right. So we're, I can well. The chart here will will sort of show you where the threshold exists, right? So this is the group born 1939 and earlier. And so this is no deductible and a 1.25% maximum. And this is a 2% deductible. So the group on the left has no deductible. The group on the right has a 2% of income deductible. And this is this chart shows you the first outcome that we looked at, which was the average fair pharmacare paid expenditure. So this is how much the public drug plan is contributing toward uh, people's drug coverage. So this is how much the province is paying out on average. And now you can see these these folks over here are older and older people tend to use more prescription drugs. So of course this is the highest point here. And then we follow the estimate and it comes and it declines over uh, over that age spectrum in a fairly linear way. And then we hit our threshold here, which is where we switch from the 0% of income deductible to the 2% of income deductible. And you can see that there's a very immediate drop in how much the public plan contributes toward people's drug coverage at that point. This is about negative $205. So the public system pays $205 less for someone in 1940 than we would expect them to have paid had they had no deductible because the public coverage would have kicked in sooner, covered more drugs and been more more generous. Um, but we can see that this is a, a pretty big um, a pretty big change. It's about um, it, it's a, it's around the negative 20% range in terms of public expenditure on drugs. So these folks are getting a lot less subsidy than their peers. But when we went and actually looked at the total drug expenditure, so this is the average drug expenditure that they have as, um, as a total, including what they pay for privately. And I wanna point out here that private in this data set can mean both out of pocket expenditures, so what you hand over to the pharmacist when you go and fill a prescription, and it can also include any amount paid by a private insurance plan. 
unfortunately in PharmaNet we can't differentiate the two of them. So all we can see is the um, all we can see is the total. But as you can see here, at that threshold, you know, remember these folks were getting these these folks here were getting negative two hundred and five dollars of public money less, far less public subsidy. But in terms of total expenditure. This estimate is about um, six dollars less drug expenditure on the right-hand side of that threshold, and it wasn't, and it wasn't even close to statistical significance. So only about a two percent estimate in, in re two percent reduction in drug expenditure. This was not the result we expected. So I'll be honest: when we started this study, I expected to see that that reduction in public coverage would lead to a lot less drug use. It's clearly not here, and so it says something about older. Uh, it says something about these populations, either in terms of the assets and income they have available to them, or the priority that they use for um, spending on uh, prescription drugs. Um, but the the reduction here is just not present. And if you look then at physician and hospital outcomes, so this is average number of physician visits. Again, this is pretty smooth right across that threshold. Um, there's a non-significant increase of about 0.4 physician visits on the right-hand side, but not different from zero in a statistical sense. And this is hospital stays. Um, so this is the average number of hospital days that they had in any given year. And you can see these, these folks are older, so they, they spend more time in hospital. Um, but again, this is quite smooth across that threshold. And the change here was um, uh, about as close to zero as one gets in a, uh, in a statistical analysis. So there's not a lot um, that appears to be going on from these thresholds other than the savings to the public purse. So let's step back a second and think about what that result actually means. So you remember earlier I talked about the local average treatment effect. So the local average treatment effect is in in this um, in this study is the income the impact of a two percent of household income deductible on individuals born in 1930 versus 1940 with household incomes between fifteen thousand dollars and thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> so I think you can ask a really honest question about how useful this is. This is a very small population of uh, of people, right? In a very small band, in a very small income band and with a very specific um, uh, deductible. So the, the regression to the continuity here, in terms of internal validity, is super strong. It's um, using quasi-randomization. There's all sorts of reasons to believe that folks born in 1939 are not systematically different from folks born in 1940. Um, but it is extremely specific. So in terms of its external validity, it's a little bit, um, uh, a little bit more questionable. So I'll answer my own question and say, yeah, it's somewhat it's somewhat useful. Um, but what it did lead us to do is to think about how we could leverage this same data set and some of the other thresholds in fair pharmacare to look at the average treatment effect in different populations. So what did we see elsewhere? So this is a the follow-up paper that we did where we used the um, deductible structure to look in lower income adults. And so this has always been a population of interest because when you do surveys uh, of people, it tends to be lower income adults that have the most trouble with drug affordability. Um, so this piece was in um, CMAJ Open, despite the fact that I think the result here is far more interesting than the other paper. It got into the, uh, the, the less cited journal, which, such is life. So we'll go back to this diagram here, the simplified dry, uh, diagram. And this time, I'm going to focus on the population on the right. So instead of going across across the year of birth as a forcing variable, we're going to use household income as a forcing variable. And you can see here, when folks step across this $15,000 threshold, they go from a deductible of 0% to a deductible of 2%. So you cross that threshold, all of a sudden your prescription drug expenditures um, from the public plan go up. And again, when you cross this $30,000 threshold, you go to a 3% of income deductible. So there were really two questions we were asking here. What happens when you go from zero to two? And what happens when you go from two to three? And here's what happens in terms of public subsidy. Um, it's not the most linear of shapes in the, uh, on the left-hand side. We tried numerous ways to model that, and I'm happy to get into it if, uh, um, if folks want to. I'll point out at first, so this is pharmacare expenditures. This 250 is far lower than the last paper I showed you because these, uh, this population of people, this cohort is far younger. Um, but you can see 
that as you cross this threshold uh, that's at $15,000, there is a very precipitous drop in how much the public sector pays uh, toward people's drug coverage. And that's about a $60 drop there. And again, here, there's about a $26 uh, dollar drop in the amount that folks are um, being subsidized by the public plan because of those, um, because of those deductibles. Now, the question, of course, is how does that translate into total prescription drug use? And the answer is it does, but, it'll, but just a little bit. So this difference here, if you follow this prediction across, you would expect it to be here, and it ends up here. It's about a reduction of $26 in total prescription drug use across that um, $15,000 threshold. So it is a it's a, it's a drop. It's a drop of about seven or eight percent in prescription drug use um, uh, when you move across that threshold. So that threshold does appear to matter. The move from two percent deductible to a three percent deductible uh, does not seem to matter. This was a change of uh, minus six dollars, but it's statistically not different from zero. So what appears to matter here is the the actual deductible itself at that lower income threshold. We did a bunch of sub-analyses to figure out if this was the case. This result persists across basically any grouping that we could come up with. Um, the size is bigger in some than others. Men tend to be a little bit more sensitive to the deductible than, uh, uh, than women, um, which I think shows just how much smarter women are than men on average. Um, but you know, there's, there's a whole lot of um, variables in that that result persisted. So let's move to the local average treatment effect here. So this is the impact of a 2% of household income deductible on individuals with household incomes around $15,000. It's a lot less specific than the first one because this, this pertains to pretty much any household um, after 15, that with incomes around $15,000. You know, so I think this is a lot more useful. It's not totally clear in this what $15,000 actually represents, and I just want to make that clear because we're using data from 2003 to 2015. Um, there's a lot of inflation that happened between those two, two time periods, so households were getting sort of systematically poorer over time. Um, but this result does stand up if you use the later data. So I think this estimate's a lot more interesting and a lot more useful, but it doesn't tell you much about households that $30,000 or $50,000 or whatnot, and whether the deduct deductible is really impacting those uh, those groups. So quickly, just in terms of overall interpretation before I move into how we actually like fit these things and model them. Um, so the deductibles like clearly substantially reduce public drug spending. The public drug plan saves a lot of money when they impose a deductible on, on folks. And that's the reason that insurers do it, is to uh, to reduce their, their output their sort of outflows and protect people above those thresholds. And based on these two studies, it did reduce overall drug use, but only really for populations at lower incomes. It didn't seem to do much for, um, for the population of older adults that we studied. And then the limitations, of course, that the local average treatment effects are limited to those existing thresholds. And we don't know how private drug coverage is playing into this. I wish that PharmaNet had a field that um, uh, told you how much third-party coverage people had because I would love to actually estimate this for the folks who don't have a private drug plan um, but we can't do, unfortunately we can't do that with the data fields that, have, that exist in PharmaNet right now. So based on this we took these we used these results to uh, and uh, you know shared them pretty extensively with folks within the ministry and our recommendation was was this move that threshold um, and uh, move it up. So make the deductible free portion of the drug plan higher. And um, in 2019, they actually did that. So that's a, um, that's a slice from the budget document in, uh, uh, in 2019 where they, um, uh, where they talked about changes to fair pharmacare. And you'll see that they actually took the step of eliminating deductibles completely for families with incomes below $30,000. Um, so following all those results, there was actually some policy that, uh, uh, that, was, that resulted, which was pretty exciting for, um, uh, for us to see. So 
if there's any questions on the example, I'm happy to do, answer them now, or we can get into actually how you fit one of these, uh, one of these, and what kind of data you need to. Yeah, uh, Olivia has a question, Michael. Can you please give an example of possible co-intervention uh, in the study on fair pharma care, or is there any? Uh, so there's none that we know of, but I can give you some hypothetical ideas. So if you imagine, you know, say there was other programs that helped that gave folks money or there was job training or there was um, anything else that happened around that household income. Um, you know, if there was uh, like if income tax thresholds were around $15,000 or any of those, uh, any of those kind of things. So if there were other social programs that, that influence things around that income level, that that's where there would be a problem. We don't think there are any, we certainly spent a lot of time trying to look and think through whether there were any, but we didn't, uh, we didn't come up with any. Was there any more, Anne? Uh, another one, oh, just another one from Edward. Uh, what about reducing the cost of prescription drugs, for example, bulk purchasing? It, sure, the, reducing the cost of prescription drugs through bulk purchasing is, uh, is certainly something that gets a lot of policy attention, a lot of, uh, a lot of discussion. In general, those kind of initiatives would save money um, as much for the insurers as it would for folks who are actually purchasing them at the uh, uh, at the pharmacy. So uh, it's a little bit of a different intervention. Um, you could bulk purchase and charge patients, or bulk, bulk purchase and not charge patients anything. So, um, but that that's certainly a policy that's gotten a lot of attention. Um, and Canadian provinces have been moving to do more purchasing together pretty extensively over the past. Uh, you know, 10 or 20 years. Okay, I think that's all the questions for this minute. Thank you. That's great. So I'll keep going into how to perform one of these, uh, one of these studies. So I have a few slides here that just show you some of the, um, some of the data requirements and, uh, and the setup. So I'm just gonna, again, move back to the first study again, where we have year of birth as a forcing variable, uh, the average amount that's paid um, by Fair Pharmacare is one of the outcomes. And then you have folks that fall into these different birth years, right? So we, we went from 1928 um, all the way up to uh, 1951. Um, so we have a, a range of years in here. And the reason I show you this first is just to, so you can remember where, um, where the data come from. And so when you run one uh, of these, essentially you're using a regression of some form to fit those ob observed lines and to model that change in the uh, that change in the threshold, and that change in the threshold is usually just denoted by an indicator variable. Um, that's one for folks on the side of the threshold where the intervention is, um, and zero on the other side where it isn't. So your data looks something like this, and this is very general, and you can do a lot of things. You can add covariates and whatnot, but this would be the sort of simplest data set setup that one can have. So you you obviously have observations that are individuals. So these denote you know certain each one of these denotes another a different uh, individual. In the analysis that I showed you, we actually used person years of data. So people were in the data set more than once. But to simplify, you just have um, you'd have an ID, and then you have your forcing variable. And so you'll see here that this is the year minus 1928. And the reason for that is just so you go one, two, three, four over over time, and it be and each year is just an increment of one. Um, so year minus nineteen twenty eight, and you can have folks that are at eleven, at two, at twenty four, and these are just different birth years along the way. The threshold variable here indicates whether folks are on the left hand side or the right hand side of the threshold. So you'll see the folks with higher forcing variables. So like 24 would be someone in this group way over here. You'll see that they get a one for being on the right-hand side of the threshold, as does this individual who's at 19 and this individual at 14. So anyone who's on the right, anyone born in 1940 or after is going to be a one on that variable and anyone on the left is gonna be a zero. And that is how you get that, that break, that, um, that, that did change in the level. You then have an interaction between um, that variable and the threshold variable. And what that takes care of is 
you you've already modeled that break that takes care of the the slope of this line because you want you want to allow that slope to to change some rds don't uh don't actually do that they just let the level shift um but typically when i've modeled these i always allow for a change in that trend afterward as well and then you have your outcome and so this would be the amount of subsidy that fair pharmacare gave these individuals these are completely fabricated data. I made these up by typing random numbers into the uh, uh, into the screen, but you would have outcomes, and and so each individual would contribute to um, uh, to the analysis with their actual expenditure outcomes. And now the simplest way to do this is with a straightforward linear regression, but you can use essentially any regression technique you want. Since we used person years, we had to account for the fact that people appear multiple times. Um, so in some instances with these, you'll want to use a hierarchical model or something of that sort, um, depending on your outcome. Like if your outcome's in something that's skewed or it's a count, you might want to use, um, you know, a GLM or um, a Poisson regression or something like that. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. But this is the basic setup that, uh, uh, that one would use for, to model a regression discontinuity. And then the basic model. Um, and apologies for those of you for, for whom um, Greek makes you shudder. It makes me shudder most of the time too. Um, but I just want to make it sort of clear what it is that the model actually looks like. So for individual J I with a threshold J enforcing variable K, those are just indicators of, you know, different, um, uh, just giving generalizable form to what we just talked about. You know, you're going to model your outcome and it's going to be the product of four variables. So your intercept term or your beta naught is the predicted level at the smallest value of the forcing variable. So if you think about it, that's this number here. Take away all my other writing so that we can see. That would be this value here. So that's your intercept term. Your beta one is gonna be the pre-existing slope in the outcome of interest. Um, and you'll see that that's um, the forcing variable minus the threshold. So that just tells you that sort of increments one dot 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 all the way up and that's going to tell you the slope of this line so that's this is your beta naught and this is your beta one you then have a beta two which is the change in the level above the threshold so that's that shift that's that break in the line that really is what you're interested in here so that's this change here that's your beta two and that, of course, is what you're interested in. That's what you're trying to estimate. You're trying to estimate the value of that break in the uh, uh, in the in the trend across the across the threshold. And then you're going to have a beta three, which is a change in the slope across that threshold. So that is on that right hand side. That just allows the slope to change. And you know, for some of those outcomes I showed you earlier, particular hospitalization, and there's a curvilinear shape to it. So allowing those slopes to be independent from one another. Um, I think allows you to do, uh, to do a better job of fitting these things. Um, when you do that, this allows you to predict two line segments, right? So there's um, a segment before, which has an intercept and a trend, and then a change in the intercept and a change in the trend. Some regression discontinuities don't use slope variables, so they won't have this beta three. Um, and I just mentioned that, so just be aware that some studies don't do that. And then some will use quadratic terms and other model modifications. So I brushed over this earlier, but in that hospitalization curve uh, that we saw that was shaped sort of like this, we actually did use quadratic curves on both sides of the uh, on both sides of the threshold to fit that better. So that's possible. The other model model modification that comes up a lot that you will see is folks will weight things um, using. Um, uh what are called triangular kernel weights uh if you ever see that term essentially that's a fancy way of uh of saying that we're going to give a higher weight to observations that are close to the threshold and we're going to give a lower weight to observations that are further away because we're of the belief that this observation here that's close to the threshold tells us more than this one that's far away from And then I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I put it here so that if you get a copy of the slides later and ever want to draw out the picture that comes from your regression discontinuity analysis, all of the points and plotting the counterfactual that I showed you earlier 
is really just a combination of the parameters that you get out of that model. So, you know, to predict the first point, it's beta naught plus beta one and so on. Um, so there's, you can use just these linear combinations of the, um, of the model parameters to, uh, to, to draw the picture. And of course, then showing the picture makes it a lot easier to explain the results. Because you'll notice earlier, I showed you the results without talking about the statistical model or the, uh, uh, or the, the parameters at all. So quickly, the, there's some problems with regression discontinuity designs. They are not a perfect design. Um, the first point here, they often require more data, data than a comparable RCT because you know, you're know you using observational data, it can be noisy. Um, it, these are bad for rare outcomes in particular because you it becomes tough to fit a, uh, a linear trend to those data. Um, it, and it relies on smoothness over the threshold. And the problem with that assumption, of course, is that it's not testable. You can't know like in, fair, in the fair pharmacare study, I can't know that that line would be smooth if fair pharmacare had no deduct deductibles because the world in which those deductibles do don't exist doesn't exist. You can do falsification tests. So you can test other things across those thresholds. So in our study, you know, we look at things like age and we look at um, comorbidities and whatnot across the thresholds and we didn't find any changes. Um, and that gives you some faith in the idea that that folks on one side of the threshold are similar to the folks on the other side. And then the last problem, I guess this isn't a problem for folks that are coming to a seminar like this one, um, but it requires technical skill to properly fit these things from a statistical standpoint. There's lots of options for the modeling technique and the weighting, and there's a really big literature, particularly out of economics, that walks you through all of the different iterations and twists and whatnot that you can use when you are uh, are actually modeling or regression discontinuity. Uh, beyond that, I can get into some of the slides on actually modeling it, but before I do that, I will plug, um, this is my class, this is a course that I put together on edX that was um, released a few years ago now, um, but there's an entire week worth of content in this class on regression discontinuities in the final class, so if you actually want to go through the modeling um, and are comfortable using R, you could sign up for this class and just work through week five, which is the uh, uh, the week where I do regression discontinuities. Interrupted time series, which I'm sure some of you have heard about itself, uh, as well, is really similar to an R, a regression discontinuity. Um, it basically is a regression discontinuity where uh, time is the forcing variable. Um, and then in terms of methods readings, I'll also direct you to these two. Um, they're both sort of high level overviews of the topic and both of them are really accessible and really well written. So, um, so both of those are, uh, are fantastic. And there's the links to the two studies that, um, um, that I went through. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Um, so, Anne, I'm happy to take questions. I also have some slides where I go through some of the code on how you actually model one of these. So, if folks are interested in going down, uh, going down that road, I could do a quick breeze through um, um, through that. But I'll leave it up to everyone who's here as to what they would uh, what they'd like to uh, what they'd like to do. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Michael, for an excellent presentation and also for the resources that you've listed here at the end. That's great. I don't see any immediate questions. So here's the example. And um, this is uh, a kind of neat application of regression discontinuities that I like. Uh, so this is a paper by Lee that's been replicated a whole bunch. Their interest here is in the effect of incumbency. So this is a real political science example. So you know it, it's not health related at all, but I think it's uh, interesting. So they use data from US House of Representatives um, elections. And I'm going to go, I'm actually going to go straight to the results. So the idea is that if you're the incumbent, you won the last election, you are more likely to win the next one just because name recognition and all those sorts of things. And I'm going to show you what the final model ends up looking like. It ends up looking like this. The incumbent party has about a 45% advantage. So this is on the bottom here, how much you won the last election by. So that's the forcing variable. So these folks lost the last election by 1%. These folks won the last election by 1%. 
and you know down to 40 percent and 40 percent because you you obviously don't lose an election by more than uh, more than that much most of the time um, but you can see here you know as the vote margin becomes closer in any given district um, your chance of winning the next election goes up but there is a massive jump at zero um, so the incumbent party advantage is estimated to be about 45 percent in this case okay so now that i've spoiled the results um, let's go to what this actually looks like so in, in the lee paper um, they use data from U.S. House of Representatives elections, and they use almost 8,000 elections from 1942 to 2006. And I think this data is actually on my edX course, so if folks are interested in, in getting the data, they can actually uh, sign up for the course and pull it down there. So, you know, you have a Democrat loss, a Democrat win, and then the RD estimate's going to be that difference. But I already showed you that, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll glaze over that at this point. Um, and then the data uh, looks something like this. So in this data set, there's an indicator for the state. So this would be the state that the data comes from. This is the year of the election, and these are US elections. So you see they, they go every, uh, every four years, every two for house elections. And then this variable here is the democratic margin. So that is the forcing variable. So the Democrats lost the first three elections here by six, four, and 5%, and they won the third one by six. So this one's on the right-hand side of the threshold. These three are on the left. Um, this is essentially the, the level variable, variable. So this is whether the Democrats won. And you can see they did not win those elections because their margin was negative, and they did win this one. And then the next variable is whether they won the next election. So you can see it's zeros here and it's ones here. So this is your outcome. Your outcome is whether they won the next one. Um, so whether the effect of winning one election makes you more likely to win the next. Um, and then these bins are just for plotting. So that's the, to plot like the, the points over time because obviously the margin of victory here is a, uh, uh, is a smooth variable. So that's the data. And then there's some work I do, do in R here to pull that data set in and whatnot, and I won't focus on that. But for those of you who are familiar with R, um, the first thing I've done here, you know, there's the democratic margin, and I've squared it to come up with a curvilinear shape. Um, and then I've come up with an interaction between the forcing variable and the threshold. So that's going to be the, uh, the slope on the right-hand side. Um, so I'm just setting up variables here, and I won't spend a ton of time on it. Um, and then in terms of the plot, you know, I mentioned that bins variable where uh, I set up the, the groupings. And so those bins are just a sequence from negative 49 up to 49 in groups of two. And that's just to plot the averages. And then I come up with the mean for each of those, um, uh, for each of those bins using the, the T apply um, code. And then this is just to plot, to, to plot them. So I'm using the means, um, plotting them against the bins. Uh, and then adding a line at, at zero. And that gets you this plot here. So these are each of the individual bins. This is the probability the Democrats won the next election. And then this is the forcing variable, the vote margin in the last election. I'm blazing over the plotting code because I want to show you the actual model code because that's the important part. Um, so the first model that you can do with this data is to fit a linear trend on both sides. Now, those of you who are modelers who do regressions will look at my linear lines there and say you're missing the point or you're missing a curve shape. You're right. We'll do that in a second. But the basic model would look something like this. You know, it's a linear model in R where you're modeling whether they win the next one as a product of uh, the margin. So that's the forcing variable, whether they won the last one. And then the, um, and so that's the, uh, um, that's whether they, they won the, the last, that's the, the threshold essentially. And then the, um, uh, and then an interaction between the threshold and the, uh, the margin from last time. And then the summary looks something like this, where you can see that the model is estimating about a 55% uh, increase in winning as a result of, uh, of incumbency. And so you can see when you fit it linearly, you get these uh, you get these straight lines, 
that don't fit the data exceptionally well, and you estimate an incumbent party advantage of about 56%. Now, those of you who are looking at this will automatically, of course, say, well, those aren't linear, those are curvilinear, and I agree with you. Um, and so the next step, of course, would be to add in those uh, square terms. So you can see in this model here, I have the margin squared and the uh, margin on the right-hand side of the threshold squared as two additional variables into the, uh, um, into the model. And you can see that the dem win, which is your threshold variable, is still important and still highly statistically significant here, but you've now estimated a 44.8% increase in the, uh, in the incumbency advantage. So the, the incumbency advantage decreases when you do that modeling. If you compare the models using a sort of straightforward um, uh, uh, F-test, you see that the second model is far better at uh, describing the actual data that you have. And you can see here that that incumbent party advantage um, is, this line is of course gonna project through to about there, and then this line is there. And so this incumbent party advantage is about 45%. So there's a huge gap um, between those lines based on who won the last election, telling you that incumbency is really important. And you, you, what you have to assume here, and I think it's a reasonable assumption, is that <laughs> Democrats who get 49.9% of the vote are reasonably similar to those that get 50.1% of the vote in all ways, except for the fact that they either win or lose the election on the basis of that 0.2%. So that's just some basic, some basic code of what these, uh, of what these look like. And as I said, that um, my course on edX has all the data and all the code. You can actually download the R scripts and, uh, uh, and dig into them uh, on there. And my apologies for the fire hose nature of that run through the uh, that run through the code. Great, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Michael, for your time, uh, and just kudos coming in to thank you again for your presentation and for sharing your slide deck. Really appreciate everything that you've done to to make sure. the the content interesting and uh, and useful for people. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much for the All opportunity. Right. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye for now.